Go ahead and get out your Bibles, turn to James chapter 4, James chapter 4, this morning. We're going to be in verses 13 through 17. We're nearly uh, done with the book of James. Uh, we're finishing up chapter 4. We've got chapter 5 uh, starting next week. Have you enjoyed uh, the book of James so far? This kind of kicked us in the tail a little bit, you know. James just means pretty serious business. We're not just going to be hearers of the word, but we're going to be what? We're going to be doers of the word. It's a book that demands action. We can't just talk about doing the right things. We've got to be people who do the right things. How many of you want to be those people in this room? Yeah. Amen. So if you're there, you're ready for God's word, say let's go. This is what it says. Come now. You who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow for what is your life. It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that, but now you boast in your arrogance. How many times has this come up in the book of James? <laughs> Arrogance, pride, a lack of humility. But now you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. Therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is what? Sin. It is sin. I've entitled my message this morning, will you live for eternity or today? It's a question I want to ask you this morning. Will we live for eternity or what? Or for today? If you like my notes, you can text notes. The number's on the screen and receive my notes this morning and what's in front of me will be sent to you. Let's pray and let's ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us this morning. Holy Spirit, we come before you today. God, we come before you today and Lord, we... Come with humble hearts, knowing, God, that none of us in this room have got it worked out, including myself. Lord, through your word, I ask that, God, that you would show us exactly, God, what you have for us. That, Lord, your word would pierce our hearts and would change us. That, God, that it would uh, encourage us to live this out today to understand and have an eternal perspective and not just a perspective that we're living for today or the things that are temporary on this earth. And so, Jesus, let your word be a lamp unto our feet and a light into our path, and may we receive it today and live it out. We love you, and everyone said in this place this morning, amen. Amen, amen. amen. I want to start off um, with one of my favorite quotes that comes from Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis, and he says this. If you read history, you'll find that Christians who did most in the present world were precisely those who thought most of the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this one. I love this um, this because it really challenges us to think about eternity, which also mirrors what James is saying here in these verses, in verses 13 through 70, 17, that we would think about eternity. We wouldn't think about just to live for today, but we think about, man, we are going to meet Jesus one day. We're going to stand before him one day, and he's going to judge us, that we would think about this next life that it's really going to be for eternity and that this life really is but a vapor. And so this morning I want to give you three things from the book of James that we can lean into and to learn. The first thing I want to give you this morning is this, is don't assume. Don't assume. Don't live presumptuously without considering God's plans. Don't assume. James begins with a very direct challenge to those who make plans without considering God's will. He says this in verse 13. Come now, you who say 
today or tomorrow we will go in such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. There's a common human tendency, the desire to control our own future. Anybody else with me this morning where you love planning? You love to plan things out. I'm a planner. At the beginning of every single week, I have a task list that I make. Now, some things are repetitive uh, that I do every single week, but I think beginning of every single week, okay, what I need to accomplish this week, what needs to get done? And so I think of those things, and then I put the appropriate allotted time that's going to take me to do, I think, to do each and every task. Now, for me, I'm a glass half full person, so I oftentimes will uh, grossly underestimate the length of time that it takes to get something done. Anybody else uh, with me on that? You think, oh, this is only going to take me one moment, and the next thing I know is it's taking me three hours instead of the 15 minutes that I thought it was going to take. It gets me in trouble very often, but I love planning. I love making plans. Now, the time that I don't love planning is when I'm on vacation, right? I don't, I don't want to make plans when I'm on vacation. I don't want to think about plans. Now, my wife, on the other hand, she definitely wants to make plans on vacation because she's like, man, I want to hit this. I want to do this. I want to do this. And I'm like, man, I don't want to know what I'm doing next. I just want to go with whatever's... I'm a free spirit when it comes to vacation. But man, when it comes to making plans for my work week, I'm a planner. I like to plan things out. I like to have my calendar set. And I actually have the software that will take a lot of time that I've got and it will plan my week out. But without fail, how many of you know that something happens and something comes up in your life and things change? And for me, I've got to say to myself, Adam, like stop getting frustrated when things come up and your plans change, Right? Life happens. We love to make plans. Some of you in this room, though, you're like, no, I don't like to make plans. I just like to be a free spirit all the time and just kind of do whatever I want to do when I want to do it. But it's important to make plans. It's important to plan out. I like to say um, if, uh, if you lack a plan, then you plan to fail, right? If you lack a plan, if you're not going to plan things for a project you're trying to accomplish, then you're planning to fail. It is good to plan things out. But what James is saying right here is it's dangerous when we plan things out without God. He makes a statement and he uses the illustration of someone who comes into a town and says, I'm going to go here, I'm going to trade, and I'm going to make a profit presuming that they're going to do it without God. He starts off verse 13 by saying what? He says, come now. Basically, he's saying is, wake up. You don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. Wake up. Your plans might change. This is a dangerous spot to get in where we presume things are going to happen, but we presume things are going to happen without God. We make plans, and there's nothing wrong with making plans, but when we plan without God, we're really planning to fail. Now, Jesus, he gives a, uh, a parable of, in Luke chapter 12 of a rich man. And the rich man, he stores everything up. He's making plans for his future. He's storing everything up. He's got um, all of the stuff for his future stored up, and he's ready to enjoy life. He says, I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry now. I've labored, I've planned, I've got all this stuff. And then Jesus says this to him. He says in verse 20, but God said to him, fool. You don't want to hear that from God, do you? (laughs) Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then then, Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. The rich man, he makes presumptions that, man, he's going to be able to enjoy everything that he's gathered in his life. And Jesus is saying to him, you fool, why would you do that? You're not rich in the one thing that matters, which is what? It is God. The one thing that matters, you're not rich in when you're rich in everything else. And you said, now I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry, enjoy this life, but you're not rich in God. You don't really even know him. And James is saying this is dangerous when we make presumptuous plans without God. Now, what is the antidote when we begin to do this? What is the antidote for our lives? When we begin to plan and presumptuously 
plan that everything's going to happen the way we think it's going to happen. Well, the first thing that I want to give you, I want to give you three things to, uh, for the antidote for presumptuous planning. So the first thing is you've got to pray before you act, right? Oftentimes what we're all guilty of, including myself, is I'll make a plan, and then with that plan, I'll ask God then to bless my plan. <laughs> Every single one of us in this room are guilty of that. We have a value around here. I actually mentioned it last week, pray first. We don't pray. Uh, we pray before we act. You've got to pray before you act, not just plan presumptuously. And then when you get the will of God in your life, you've got to understand, okay, I'm going to walk this out in boldness, but I'm also going to walk it out with humility. I'm going to walk with the Lord humbly, as we talked about last week, about how those five things uh, is a step towards being a friend of God, walking with him humbly. And as we walk with him humbly, the third thing comes up is oftentimes we got to realize that, man, we are human beings, and sometimes the things that we heard were from God, but sometimes they were just our own selves. And so we got to then be able to understand, okay, if God tells me to do something else and to pivot, I'm going to be willing to pivot, Right? We had to walk humbly with the Lord as a, a friend would. I think of Abraham in this situation. He's a great illustration. He was told to go sacrifice his son, Isaac. He was obedient. He went all the way up to the mountain, ready to sacrifice his son, Isaac. Was right there, ready to do it. But then what happened? God came and said, no, you don't have to do that anymore. I see your heart. You see how God sometimes steps in in the middle of something and we can be so sure God did it, but we'd have to be walking with our lives continuously saying, okay, Lord, where are you leading now? Where are you directing me now? And walk continuously with a humble heart without planning presumptuously. So the next thing that, that James is talking about that I want to give you this morning is this, is life is short, right? Life is short. He says this in verse 14, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow for what is your life, it is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. James is not only speaking to the unpredictable uh, way that life changes our plans, but also how life is unpredictable in itself. We live with assumption that tomorrow will inevitably come. But we have really no idea what the future might hold, do we? We don't know what's going to happen when we leave this place today. I mean, our lives can change with one single phone call, with one doctor's report. It can change in one moment. It can change with, uh, when, when we leave, when we leave this place today. Like, are we right with the Lord? Uh, I think that one illustration that is really near to all of us who are close to situation with um, the brother that we love, Eddie, just three weeks ago, right? He, um, second service, had a heart attack right over here in the middle of service. And I believe that the Lord orchestrated everything and put it all together so that he could be healed. What do we do? The people of God begin to pray. We begin to pray and ask God for not death, but for what? For life. And so we begin to pray, and then the nurses within our congregation begin to respond and begin to do CPR on him. Our RIT team responded and did, did their thing, right? And then the first responders came in, and they, they used their expertise and everything that they had been trained to do, and God used everything and orchestrated a miracle. What if the people of God didn't pray? What if the nurses in our congregation didn't respond the way they responded? What if the IR team wasn't organized, didn't do their part? What if the first responders weren't here? I mean, God orchestrated everything to see this miracle take place. He used all of it, did he not? He used all of it. It's unbelievable what God did. I mean, that afternoon, I carried on a conversation with him. We were laughing. We were crying in the hospital. But when we think about this moment, it could have gone much differently. It's pretty sobering to think how quickly life can change in one instant. The life, James is saying, is but a vapor. 
but a mist. I mean, he's comparing it using the metaphor. I mean, I love going up to the mountains. What I love about it is the cold air. And when you breathe in mountain cold air, what happens? There's this vapor that comes out. There's this mist, right? But it's gone within a second. And he's using this metaphor to describe how quick our lives are on this earth. How fleeting life really is. And David, he talks about this in Psalms, and he says, he says this, O Lord, uh, chapter 39, verse 4, O Lord, make me know my end and what is the measure of my days. Let me know how fleeting I am. David's asking for an eternal perspective in this verse. He goes on and says, Behold, you have made my days a few hand breaths. In other words, the length of his hand is how his, he's measuring his days. And my lifetime is as nothing before you. Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath. And then in Isaiah, we read this in, verse, in chapter 40, verse 6 through 7. All flesh is grass. Pretty interesting comparison. All flesh is grass and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows on it, surely the people are grass. Just as grass withers and flowers fade, so too does our lives. We are temporary. We live in a temporary world that will one day pass away. There's a warning here not to hold on to the things of this world too tightly. Because the things of this world will pass away. You know, we, we live really when you look at it, when you think about the vapor, you think about how David describes that our lives are fleeting. We live really in zero time when it's compared to eternity. Let me kind of give you an illustration with this. That time is really, the time that we are here is really zero time. We live to, say you live to the age 90, Right? 90 divided by infinity is a finite number. It's basically zero time. Now, if you were to live to the oldest person on the planet right now, she's 116 years old. I looked up this week, lives in Japan, take 116. I mean, if I'm living 116, like, Lord, just go ahead and take me home already. Like, I want to be with Jesus at that point. I mean, come on. Like, it's time for me to be at home with the Lord. But 116, even that big of a number, if you live that long, divided by eternity is what? It's still pretty much zero. Let's take it a step further now. Say a leader walks into this room and says, the way you live for the next 24 hours is going to determine the next 1,000 years that you live. Say you could live to 1,000 years. What would you do? You would live with purpose, would you not? You would live with absolute purpose. You're going to do everything you possibly can for the kingdom of God in those next 24 hours because that's going to determine the next 1,000 years, which when we think about 1,000 years, like it's really hard to even conceive in our minds, right? I mean, 1,000 years ago, America didn't even exist. A thousand years ago, air conditioning wasn't even around. I mean, God help us. Like, I can't imagine living without air conditioning. Like, I, I will submit to you this morning that the air conditioning is like the greatest invention of all time. I would not be living in Florida if that was the case. I didn't have any air conditioning. We can't conceive what a thousand years really is. Let's take another step forward. Imagine if that same leader came in and said the next 24 hours and the way that you live is going to determine the next million years. We have no conception of that, do we? But even still, a million years divided by infinity is still a finite number. I mean, 6,000 years ago was when Adam and Eve came around. We have no conception of how great and how quick life really is when compared to eternity. Just think about that for a moment. Eternity, like forever, forever, and ever, and ever, and ever. The way we live right now will determine how we spend eternity. Now, you might be thinking in this room right now, well, Adam, I'm going to heaven. Uh, yeah, if you've given your life to Jesus, 
you're going to heaven because we are saved by grace through faith, not by works. Ephesians, it says this. It's really important for you to understand this. We've got to read this together. Uh, Verse 8, it says, For by grace you have been saved through what? Through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a what? A gift of God. Now, would you say these next three words with me? I think it's on the screen. Not of works. I want you to get this in your heart right now. Say it again. Not of works. One more time. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. So for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a free gift that God gives to us, not of works, lest anyone should boast boast. In other words, you cannot do anything to earn salvation. You're not saved by the works that you do. It is a free gift given. When you call me, you say, God, I believe in you, and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. It is by grace you are saved, not by works. But do our works matter as Christians? They absolutely Matter. I want to give you two words here. Many of you guys have heard me say this before. Belief and behavior. I like to put it this way. Um, Our belief determines where we'll spend eternity. Our behavior determines how we'll spend eternity. When we get to heaven, we will be judged by what we do and what we do not do. For those who go to hell, and hell is a very real place, they will be judged by their wickedness. There's two different judgments. There's the great white throne judgment where every unbeliever will be. There's a judgment seat of Christ where every believer will be. And at that place, when we stand before the Lord one day, we will be judged by what we do and what we don't do. And that will determine how we live for eternity. Make no mistake about it. What we do on this earth right now, it absolutely matters. The time in which we're here for this very short period of time will determine how we spend eternity. A vapor of time. Things can change very quickly. Our lives are fleeting. The time in which we have, we've got to make it count. We've got to share the gospel. We've got to meet the needs of the orphan, the widow, the least of these. Because what we do matters. Which leads me to the next point this morning, point number three, my last one. From the book of James, we can gather is this, is knowing isn't enough. Our knowledge is not enough. Knowing about God is not enough, is it? I mean, even the demons know about the Lord. Knowing is not enough. We've got to believe, we confess, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be saved, but we've also got to make our lives count. Because we know the right things to do, but we do not do it often. All of us, myself included. We're so full of knowledge, but we fall short on action. This is why James says, do not be just doers of the word, but what? Hears of the word. James 4, 17. Let's read this together. Therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is a sin. To him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is a sin. James is saying here that if you do not do good, the things you know you're supposed to do, it is a sin. Now remember, he's writing to believers here. And he's writing because what we do and what we don't do, it matters. So in this verse, though, he's talking about the sin of omission and not the sin of commission. There's a difference between the two. Let me tell you the difference. The sin of commission is when a person actively does something wrong, like lying, stealing, or committing any action that violates God's commands. That's not what he's talking about here. It's not what James is talking about. He's talking about the sin of omission. The sin of omission is when a person fails to do something they ought to do according to God's will, 
and is neglecting a good action, such as not helping someone in need. Essentially, the sin of omission is stepping outside of God's will for our life. So here's the question. How should we live if we as believers are going to be judged? How should we live if we as believers are going to be judged? Look at 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 14 to answer this question. It says this, Paul writes, because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building on it. But whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, and jewels. The gold, silver, and jewels represents eternal. But the next thing that he says here, wood, hay, and straw, represents temporal things. Either we're going to build one of two ways. We're going to build with gold, silver, and jewels, or we're going to build with wood, hay, and straw. Let me give you an example. Say someone is on the worship team, and their goal is to be seen. Their goal is to sound good. Their goal is to impress people. What are they building with? Wood, hay, and straw. Their motives are wrong. I'm thankful that none of our worship team feels that way. Amen? But what if their goal is to simply, man, I want to see Jesus lifted up. I want to minister to him. I want people to encounter the living presence of God. What is that person building with? Gold, silver, and jewels. Or the person back in the back right now who is watching over a young kid and holding them. They're only one years old and praying over them. Or the person uh, who is in youth ministry and stays late and prays over our teenagers. What are they building with? They're building with gold, silver, and jewels. Or the person in the parking lot who's giving a smile as someone's walking in to the door or one of our guest service teams. What are they building with gold, silver, and jewels? Or the person who after church today uh, sees someone and God quickens their heart and says, hey, pay for their, their bill at, at, at lunch today. And you pay for the bill and you go over to them and say, listen, I just want to let you know that Jesus loves you. What are you doing? You're building with gold, silver, and jewels. But what is our motive? Our motives in doing this. Because if our motive is wrong, we can be doing the right thing but have the wrong motive. And if our motive inside of our heart is wrong, and the only person who can really truly judge our motive is who? It's God. It's the Holy Spirit. It's not other people. And if our motive is wrong, we're building with wood. Hey, and straw. Lord, let our motives be pure. Look at this next, next part here, verse 13. But on the judgment day, fire, everybody say fire. Fire will reveal what kind of work each builder, because you're a builder, you're a builder for the kingdom of God, whether you recognize it or not. Each builder has done, the fire will show if the person's work is of any value. When you put the fire underneath for someone who's just wanting self-glorification, what happens? Poof, gone, burn up. But when you put the fire underneath someone who just wants to bring the kingdom of God here on the earth, it purifies the gold, silver, and jewels. You put the fire underneath it, it purifies it. So what is the standard by which we will be judged? It is the word of God. God. Jeremiah talks about the word of God being the fire. What the fire does, what the word of God does, you cannot afford not to be in the word of God every single day, church. You cannot afford not to be in his word every single day because what the word of God does as you read it, whether you recognize it or not, is it is shaping your heart and it is shaping your motives and it shows, it shows things in your life that is unpure, that is not of him and it allows the word of God to come in and to rightly divide what is actually really happening inside. It reveals to you, am I doing it with the right motive 
Am I living for the Lord or am I living for myself? Am I living to glorify myself and for other people to see me or am I living for the Lord? And only the word of God can do that for ourselves. The word of God purifies that. That's why I say, man, read, read, uh, well, I love to read a, a proverb every single day because there's wisdom. I love to read a psalm every day because it brings uh, just an awareness of just how wonderful and good God is. And I love to uh, read a gospel every single day, one of the, a chapter in the gospels because I want to see Jesus. I want to see what he's done. Worship, wisdom, Jesus. And I just, man, I think, man, if we would just get in the word every single day, it will purify our hearts. It will purify our motives because it really does matter. The word of God is what will judge us. Look at what Jesus says in John 12. He says, he who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last days. The word of God will judge us. Look at verse 14 now. If you work... If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burnt up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved. In other words, they're going to heaven. But like someone barely escaping through walls of flames. I don't know about you, but I don't want that to be me. I don't want to stand before the Lord one day and everything that I thought I was doing for the kingdom just to be burnt up before me. And all I've got to show for it is I've barely gotten to heaven without pleasing the Lord, without fulfilling the mission of what God has called me to do. Think of it like this. You know, we prepare for retirement, right? It's wise to prepare for retirement. It's wise to plan. Nothing wrong with planning. We prepare for retirement. But imagine on the day of retirement. You've retired. You're ready to retire. Everything is set into place. You've planned. You've got everything you need. You're going to spend the next 30 years just enjoying the work of your labor, like we talked about in Luke 12, that parable that Jesus gave. And on that day, your bank goes bankrupt. There's no more money in your bank account. On that same terrible day, the U.S. Treasury goes bankrupt as well, and they can't cover the banks, and so they're not bailing them out. Done for, you're not getting any of that money. And then on that same day, your house burns down. A really terrible day. And then on that same day, the insurance company that you have, it also goes bankrupt. And everything that you saved up, everything that you worked for, everything that you planned for, as you presumptuously planned without being rich with the Lord, everything is gone. And Paul is saying right here, this is how many believers will enter eternity. This is how many people will enter eternity. They've made plans for themselves, plans to enjoy life. I'm going to make it to heaven. I'm going to dance the streets of gold. But they never did anything for the kingdom of God. And when they did do something for the kingdom of God, it was from a heart and a motives that were impure. Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians. He says, run your race so that you may lay hold of what? The prize. My challenge to you this morning is we've got to run our race so that we may lay hold of the prize. The world that we're in right now, it seems like, man, it's all falling apart. But he's put us here for such a time as this to make a difference for the kingdom of God. And he trusts you. He trusts me. We cannot live for the temporal things of this life, but we, may, we must have a perspective of the eternal. With an eternal perspective, understanding Man, what matters is truly the kingdom of God. What matters is truly what happens on the other side of eternity. You see, majority of Christians 
who are saved from eternal damnation by the gospel or now sitting back and making excuses for not sharing the gospel which saved them. The very reason we have been saved is for a global mission, amen? And anything less than passionate involvement of building God's kingdom is selling God short and frustrating the very purpose in which we all exist. Listen, I implore you this morning, share Jesus, live out your calling. If you are a Christian and frustrated with your life and you're in this room today, it might be because you have become distracted with the very reason that you are alive. You've gone to the other things of this world to fill you up and you're being felt empty and you're wondering what is going on. Why am I depressed? Why do I have anxiety? Because you're running from the will of God. May the will of God for your life come to fruition. May you live on mission for Jesus. And listen, judgment begins in the house of God, no doubt about it. It begins in the house of God, but so does the winds of revival. So does the move of the Spirit of God. When a people are called by the name of the Spirit of God, I mean to humble themselves, truly humble themselves and pray and to seek the Lord. The promises of God is that he will heal the land. Will you go into the mission that God has called you to or will you begin to live for the temporal things that will one day pass away? We owe the world an encounter with Jesus. And anything less than that is going to frustrate the destiny that God has called you to do. And so may you humble yourself. Allow the Spirit of God to come up inside of you. Stop living as though life is going to be here tomorrow. For we do not know what tomorrow may bring. Stop boasting about tomorrow. Stop thinking, man, my plans are going to come to existence. Who knows what happens? Everything can change on a whim. Everything in America can change suddenly. You've got to prepare yourself. Live not for today, but live for eternity. We owe the world encounter with Jesus with the love of the one who saved us, who healed us, who set us free. My call to you this morning is that may you be awakened to the one thing that will fulfill you, which is Jesus. It's Jesus. Not this world, not the things that we chase after, not the desire for the American dream, not one day I'm going to retire. No, live for Jesus. Live for Jesus. Live for the one thing that's going to fulfill every single desire within you. Live for him. James gives us an example of this man who says, foolishly, Come now. I'm going to go, I'm going to trade, I'm going to profit. How many of us are so guilty of that mindset? And he's saying to them, man, live for the will of God. Live for the will. In verse 15 he says, live for the will of God. And this is not something that we have to just, um, just say as a, a formality of, yeah, I'm going to live for God's will. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. No, it has to be something as a deep conviction within our heart in every single moment. So I'm going to live for the will of God and not my own. Live as you ought to. It's part of God's will. If you're with me this morning, would you rise to your feet? Do you want to live on mission for Jesus? You will live for one purpose and one reason only, and that is his will above everything else. So God, right now over this room.